Okay. Well, this is a one from a Jean V, who I think you're new to the question, to the comment section, maybe, Jean. And I'm, I'm going to indulge Jean at the risk of comparing apples and oranges. <laughs> I mean to do this a little bit tongue in cheek, but I like, there's something about your question that's fascinating, and I have addressed aspects of it before. Um, you know, certain things happen in society. Uh, you know, certain certain inventions, certain conversations, uh, ideas, um, um, philosophic and others. They seem to be coming to people's minds at rather different places at the same time, and um, so it wouldn't be surprising if if what uh, Gene is asking whether or not. Photography, sculpture, and other things could be compared in some way to the Boston School, uh, and um, but I've I think I've entitled this well enough to give me some leeway. Apples and oranges, we'll see. Nevertheless, I thought it might be amusing to indulge the question just to, for nothing but entertainment, if nothing else. And I have addressed these things before, so let's just get right into it here. Hi, Paul. I just wanted to say that you have changed my way of understanding drawing and painting. I've been watching your videos for almost a year, and although I have only grasped a few of the concepts, it's been enough to improve my skills. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, to improve my, to improve by miles. Now when I draw, I use longer lines, try to articulate shapes that I see, and try to measure with my eyes instead of sight, size, and construction drawing. Also, these are all delightful to me to hear, uh, Gene, by the way. <laughs> I know that they're going to give you more joy and more, some, some things, some, what would you say, some qualities that you've not been able to attain other ways. And I, they'll give them to you earlier, too, so... Um, also, I've discovered artists like Degas, Tarbell, Millet, through your videos. I do have a few questions. What book or authors would you recommend for those who want to understand the Boston School methods of drawing and painting? <laughs> well, <laughs> that one, I'm not doing this video to answer that question. Um, I'm laughing because uh, of the drag on my book, not getting my book published, um, getting it out there to you. I want you to just, I want you to know that I'm thinking about doing this in chapter by chapter form and make, you know, allow people to subscribe to it uh, like a magazine. And uh, so I can, and then it'll be an incentive to me to get it out there to you. And uh, by that, at that point, by the way, it's also a draft idea, an idea of doing this in rather a draft format, a something that can be a work in progress. I may add to it and that sort of thing. And then you'd be the beneficiary of whatever I add. But just a thought I've had, I have not have heard of anybody doing that, but I'd like, I'm, I'm working on it. So if I haven't mentioned it before, there it is. All right, so that was number one. Uh, but I do, by the way, in the meantime, do recommend you read Hale's book on, on Vermeer and, um, and um, R.A.M. Stevenson's book on, um, Velasquez. None of these books, I don't have, there are no books that will give you the method of there's no such thing. Um, you have to, you'll have to extract their way of thinking from the, what I try to recommend through these videos. I'm your primary source, and if I can manage to get my book out there, that'll be the one. But you also should read Gamble's uh, Twilight of Painting and notice how he talks about Impressionism versus classical painting, and you'll have some better idea. Talk about the Boston School, um, I'm sorry, the Boston Painters, another book by Gamble. Read that, read uh, the book uh, on Bunker, which I think my guys are going to be uh, having ready pretty soon um, for you just to get off of our Twilight of Painting website. And do go to that website, um, thanking Blake for that. Do go to that website and um, take advantage of whatever's there, okay? Uh, we are trying to put essays and books and things there that, that are be free of charge uh, along the lines we're talking about. One thing I keep trying to say to you, and I'm going to say more in this video, is that Gamel and the Boston School aren't the same thing. And um, there's a, because the method is the school, and Gamel didn't paint, he says, he says do, as I, do as I say, not as I do. And today you're going to see a quote from him. That rather reminds us of how that is. 
but you'll see. I uh, think that's a bit of a treat coming up here. Is the Impressionist method now, this is where we get number two, is the Impressionist method only applicable to painting and drawing? Well, the method, you know, method, oil painting methods and watercolor painting methods, for example, or etching methods are different. The way of thinking about the visual world, though, that's the unity of it, you know? So we were painting the impression, they were, we could be etching the impression or making an etching from a drawing done from the impression or whatever that goes on. And if we're to the extent that we're using the visual and not the actual as our model, which you'll see clear, more clearly in a minute, um, they will tend to be the same. On the other hand, if you're talking about this as a stylistic thing, that would be a different story. There are numbers of things I show. I'm gonna show you Steichen and some other people in a second. And I've addressed that before where I'm showing you how photography um, in, for example, the film noir uh, model has something of that coming out of a fog, the, the uh, treatment of, of the uh, entertainment created by the spotting and the, and the visual um, uh, effects by, made by light. Um, but anyway, so is the Impressionist method only applicable? Method, Impressionist method, Boston School method is what it is. My method is what it is. They, mine is definitely, is definitely derived from having heard the aphorisms of the Boston School. But, um, and, but and, it, and significantly, dry, as I said, derived from seeing the starts of the Boston School as well as studying their work in other ways. Um, and, and of course, listening to uh, the things Gemmel did have to say. But, but Impressionist method oil painting just is different from other methods. You know, they don't quite work the same way because they're not the same mediums. But I'm going to show you a sculpture as well. So this is, I'm saying too much introductory stuff here, but I'm trying to just get into this and I'll walk away from this uh, query in a second. And then, or I guess this would be three, can it be applied to other media like sculpture and photography? If so, what artists would you recommend? So that's my task for today to suggest that there's a little bit of something about the Boston School in a number of different people's work. And I'm trying to show you something of the difference of what other kinds of work would look like, some of which is today's new realism. A few of those people who are doing it actually laying claims to being Boston School. So let's just go on with the videos and hope you can get some fun out of this. I don't mean to make this too serious. I'm not being adamant. This is not a yes, this is the method applied to something else or anything like that. I don't want to say that. But I am going to give you a little bit of a feast because I like talking about these issues um, of the um, a feast. Um, you know, a, a, a dish <laughs> served up. <laughs> Uh, uh, just looking at the Boston School, these three guys, if you want to understand Boston School methodology or thinking, you can see it in these three paintings. You can see what they do, what they don't do. It's significantly, the Boston School approach is noticeable in what it doesn't do. And I'm talking about how it doesn't articulate every little thing and doesn't create the idea of fingers per se and doesn't have a, doesn't have a, a, a conscience about making a thing look real it will be true, and Gamel has a very good word for that, which I'll give to you in just a second. But just notice the truth in these things. Now think about that word, truth. I'm looking at DeCamp in the middle, Tarbell left, Benson right. And you, what you're seeing is these guys using in practice the application of the visual order, coming out of a fog, um, executing the, or designing along by way of the visual delight, you know, the, the visual spotting, the et cetera, et cetera, you know, of the of the eyeball rather than the organizing of objects in a in a old school way. Anyway, but you just look at them. I'm recommending that you'll look at them. You'll see what I call single edge drawing. You'll see that the organization of the drawing of the fingers is nothing like an ang. And I've showed you this before. You can see this all in other visuals, in other videos. Okay, so if you'll please do that. Uh, take a review of some of those when you, as you follow up. This is trying to be what it is <laughs> for itself. So the important, Gamel uh, left this behind on a piece of paper. He, this is Gamel's handwriting. I'm putting it up there for you to be amused by. Gamel something in the 80s, is 85 or something at this point. His writing looks like the, a little bit like probably what mine's starting to look like. The important blank, it should be say, thing to remember is that a painter must seek exactitude. And there you are, those of you guys who 
who love, you know, who, who are hanging on the word truth with me and want to go turn it into some metaphysical thing, you know. Gamble does a very good thing here. He says, must seek exactitude in his, vis his visible shapes. So it's visible shapes, the shapes that hit your retina, the visible shapes. And his color relations, not in actual shapes, and local color. So when he says actual shapes, you're, you're a little closer to what people were trying to do way back when they were trying to make hands and fingers in the science was how to make the nose, that sort of thing. But keep those two things in mind. This is a really excellent thing. This is one of those things I post. I, I, I don't know what I've done with the original, but at some point I had the wit to photograph it, and so I posted it on my wall. And I would love to have had his signature on it somewhere, but I don't. Anyway, get that? The important thing to remember is that a painter must seek exactitude in his visible shapes, in his color relations, not actual shapes and local color. And so... Um, let's look at how things sort of begin. This is Western art, and you know that the, the um, Renaissance was a product of seeing, really seeing classic, classical architecture. Uh, uh, maybe you might say for the first time, really addressing it, really looking at it and realizing the amazing things about it that were so wonderful. This one on the left, which is purported to be by, and I think Pliny says that that's who it's by, these three guys. And I don't know anything about anything else these guys did. Athenodorus, Haggis and uh, Polydorus of Rhodes. The one on the right is by Rudy, a French sculptor, of obviously of monuments and things. What you will see at all times in this sort of sculpture is you will see a careful articulation of things like feathers. Everything is articulated to the realism. And now, it, many people misunderstand that what we're doing in the Boston School model, we still have realism, but we do it at these, what I call significant places. We still articulate truth, but we're not trying to make our big, as I said, our conscience isn't to make the truth of the object. It's to make the truth of the visual impression. So whatever we do do, there's not going to be an exactitude about it. And keep that in mind. Gamble's thing is so important. So just notice this. So you notice, you notice these guys. There's a certain... Um, uh, drift to these things, a certain, uh, you know, accent here and blank there, you know, lost and found, coming out of a fog thing that goes on. But this is not what goes on when you're talking about these guys, everything. Now, this is sculpture, admittedly, right? But everything is articulated. When you get uh, to Michelangelo, here he is doing exactly that. We use the noses and the eyes from sculptures like this as our example of the study form of the mouth, uh, and notice the one below, I, I, something that's always amused me. It's, I think, on the Giuliano um, Medici uh, uh, tomb. But you'll notice that everything that he's created, he's turned into something. It becomes a feather. It becomes an actual real thing, a mustache. In a literal progressive sense, it's all there, that sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying more about this right or wrong or anything like that. I love these things. And <laughs> you and I'd be surprised if you don't too. Uh, but I'm just, we're differentiating, um, well, we, which for many you could call style, but it's a look. And it's one of them is more organized around what a thing is and making sure that it, you show in your work the isness of it, right? The actual um, uh, thing itself, make sure it's clear what this is. The impressionist gets satisfaction out of the way things play to each other and the music that's made. It's a different thing. I say that meaning as you get as you get further in to the Degas model, for example. Now here again, you see that this is now in painting. This is the on the left, Raphael and Ang, his disciple, so to speak, uh, his um, his follower, and much later. But you'll see in this model, every leaf is being made. Right, everything becomes its leaf, and all that sort of that. The leaves and the trees are probably counted, um, and so on it goes. The eyes and all that sort of thing, they're all done. And so you see the same thing here. Everything is actually literally worked up into this, what we're going to call now realism, okay? Not a very, not a particularly good word, but it is that idea of making an object become fully the object as much as you can on a canvas in a two-dimensional world. And your skills at interpreting form and, and, and uh, all that uh, become crucial, you know, getting proportions right, um, et cetera. 
So, but you'll see, as I said before, now let's just see if I can just jump up there in two seconds. The Boston School thing, and especially take note, say, shall we say, of this one here on the left, and or any of them actually, but just, you don't have to look at these hard, just look at them easy, and you'll see quickly that these are operating from different places. So, it's not stylistic, it's actually a choice between whether we're doing objects and telling, saying this is, this is in a portrait, by the way, you are doing that. But, but this is the glove, this is the thing, this is the glove, that's the scarf, this is her room, that's the, you know, uh, that's all something all portrait painters will do, but the Boston School guys will actually stop having gotten a, a quality of beauty in the, in the abstractions. They will stop well before they get to this thing that I call that conscience of the realist. Now, Michelangelo, you saw what he came from, but he's actually evolved, he takes paintings of sculptures out of the fog. He actually literally draws forth the figure from a kind of like the mud, you know, and, um, and, he's, he's, and he's drawing it forth out of the model in almost a Boston school way. So I thought that was quite amusing to see that, that idea. Um, and not, nothing, but I sometimes wonder if that was the thing that people saw. People even like, like others way up, you know, along the line after, but right up to Rodin, what they saw in his work, they, they gave him an idea because there's something very poetic about this, something very evocative and suggestive in a poetry kind of a way, rather than explicated in the, in the and, your, and your quality of your work became the fine study of the, of the many form bumps along the anatomy, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the beauty of that particular figure you, you, you know, you created in the Greek model, you know, the ideal figure or whatever. Wildly, wildly different thing, different idea. And you can see that in the one in the bottom right again, this is the Michelangelo, I don't know why I put a square on that. Huh. Um, but there's a, there's a two sets of reliefs. The one above, maybe the one to the left too, but I, the one above at least is the, uh, from the, from the, um, the, uh, gate, the Gates of Hell by, by Rodin, where you can see a lot of this visual lost and found stuff, the stuff coming out. And it doesn't mean you'll never see that in, in, in other painters, in other sculptors at, at different times. I'm trying to think whether Ghiberti shows that or not. But Michelangelo's is, is, um, doesn't take advantage of that in the same way, you know, in the same... It's not trying to... Michelangelo's isn't even trying to sculpt space in that way, like clouds or drapery or mud or whatever these guys are coming out of fire. Um, but nevertheless, there's something that goes on in these areas that actually rather r reminds one of the Boston School. And I don't want to make more of it than that, except for this one point. Tarbell said, Rodin sculpts the way we paint. What I would suggest to you is that what he's saying is that Rodin thinks and uses his eyes in the same way as a Boston School guy does with the idea of what are, what are the, what, what's the eye play? How does, how, what's happening in here that pertains to eye and visual relationships? Uh, as, a, as an exercise in and of itself. Uh, so, yeah. I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to actually say more than this possible, you know, it, it is what it is. So again, if, if you're looking at the Michelangelo model, there you are, and that very articulate, careful making of eyelids and, and everything being specified, the ice cream on the hair, um, <laughs> the soft serve ice cream on this for hair, um, but all articulated carefully, then you'll have this kind of thing where you see blobs. Now you're in the world of blobs. You could say what you want about that, but this world, this, there is a kind of becoming that happens in the Boston School. So you're, it, it's not like you aren't aware of the same world exactly. You're aware of form, you're aware of everything. But your approach is, is, is by addressing um, key visual phenomena and noticing what it is as pictorial abstraction, not as form of nose or form, 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 form all day long. But the form is just one of the multiple elements. So uh, sometimes a blob of hair, something like that, will be more he more highly. It's some part of it will be articulate again. The way Gamble says exactitude, it, there are some part of that will be very articulate, and other parts far less said and and left to to go, in a very similar way to what you'll see in the Boston School. 
It was a Victor Hugo portrait. Um, both the left two, I think, are Victor Hugo. I don't know who the right one is, unless it's Balzac. And here's again Rodin, where you can maybe see a little more of what he's doing. And now this is, of course, in clay and not stone or something like that. But but you can see this the visual uh, suggestive stuff, visu the stuff that's suggestive visually. All sculptors do this on some level. But not the same precise way. There's something about this, Rodin, something about even Medardo Rosso and a couple other guys, where it's so self-evident that they're working with the with the way shapes play to each other, more than they're working with this idea of getting a mouth. And I'm not saying these are more than studies. Uh, they are, I appear to me, essentially studies. And that will often show up, these qualities will often show up, at these, the, the idea of suggesting rather than explicating will show up in studies all through history. So I didn't want to make too much of that, but Gravely was a, a teacher at the, Boston, at the museum school with Tarbell and those guys. And to, to what extent he was also, I mean, you can see there's a lot of similarities um, in his work with, um, well, there's a painterliness in his work. This is a Duvenek portrait on the right. There's a painterliness, which is something sort of characteristic of the of the sergeant slash Zorn slash Boston School model. Uh, there's a, there's a, a sense of flow and there's an articulation of points and that sort of thing in that way um, that seems to be much more derivative of, of, of or I should say from um, the eye and what catches your eye then from knowing hair and knowing, you know, these guys do know all that. Sculptors, I mean, their thing all day long is the form, is the ear form. It's always there. But the whether they approach it from that's all in the story. But I don't want to make more of it than it is. I'm only saying this guy did have associations with with um, um, the, tar the Boston School, Tarbell, those guys, uh, as a teacher there in, in, in the Boston area. And then he in other areas, too. I think he taught in maybe four or five different places, if I'm not mistaken. He also is the author of an excellent article in Encyclopedia Britannica, I don't know if they still publish that in the latest versions or if that goes, or where that, uh, I know I had a 1929 version, I think, where he, I think that's where he did it. Could have been a later one, but I think that's what I've got. But you can again look at the same thing. There's a certain great sense of form and a certain articulate. So there's a great sense of the, the great flow and the articulation of points. And he's, he's you know, the judicial, the judiciary or the, um, uh, judicious rather. <laughs> Sure. Right. Um, uh, anyway, you can figure out more. I'm not a sculptor. My experience with sculpture is uh, fairly limited, although, although it was, it's real. I actually spent time studying with individuals. But you go back a bit here and you get this bit drawings by sculptors. And by the way, Leonardo was also a sculptor. But what you're going to see, and this is Alfred St Stevens now, the British sculptor. What you see in this drawing is miles away from what you see in this drawing, or this one by McMoney's even. This is McMoney's, was a student at the Art Students League, I believe. And uh, in fact, I think that's the drawing I tell you about. Not the drawing, but the um, painter whose drawing of a figure I saw and said, where is this? Said to myself into the register, where did they teach this at the Art Students League? <laughs> he was an academic figure. But, but you can see there's a, a strong visual uh, correlation here. Uh, in his drawing, correlation, rather, the approach takes on a bit more of this than this one does. This is much more outline into form drawing. You know, when if you say that, like Degas, that drawing is what happens between the contours, uh, it's a little more like that than this whole idea of who knows, right? This is just the general impression model of Benson. But the older model is literally drawing eyes. And when I was a student with Gamel, he sent us, as a, when I was doing portraits, he he sent me forward to, to draw in line the eye. So I walked forward to the model and stood there and just studied one eye in the same way as Leonardo here. And uh, that was a thing that he did. When you get to that question that comes up with uh, Hale when he says, oh, uh, people started noticing, maybe himself, that he was drawing eyes with a blob. Now we're talking Vermeer. Uh, he was drawing eyes with a blob instead of with lines you're noticing there's something very different going on. And I'm just mentioning it, but I should just run through these because you can just look at them because you can just see where certain people 
have something in common. Here's Rodin doing an etching. This is Victor Hugo again. Does that look like it could easily be a Boston school uh, articulation? Now, I, to what extent that's a Boston school kind of start, it really doesn't appear to be much of one, but I'm not telling you anything more about it. It's hard to judge of what that is. There is a certain amount of visual order in it, but it doesn't, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not as explicitly so as I try to be in my own work. But here's Zorn. It's actually a portrait of, of uh, Rodin himself. But this is where you can also see the application of something like this method, uh, uh, Gene. And uh, this even, for whatever, whatever we can tell about this, and again, I'm not an engraver either, or nature, I don't do this kind of stuff. But there's a whole lot, myriad of lost and found and, art, and drawing of things that are significant, just areas of great significance. And uh, so there's this order visual. Right? You can see that in both of these strongly. In things that are well pushed, everybody gets visual order on some level. But these guys, this is as nice as, a, as an example as we're going to see, um, where you can see, and you can see it really well in the in the portrait, uh, in the one, I think it's called the, um, uh, the no, it's not called the bus, but it's a picture of something like a bus in um, where these two or three people are sitting and the lights glancing off of them in the Gardner Museum in Boston. But you can see this thing is organized around the entertainment of spots of light and effects of light. And the, the whole idea, I mean, one of, the, one of the beauties of what the Boston School approach does uh, is it delivers the possibility of doing pictures like where you can't really see the head and, and that becomes accessible to you far more readily. Anyway, I don't know why I'm saying these. It's just, but these are two, you can see these two have so much in common with Boston School. Um, a pleasure with light and 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 de delight in distributing um, spotting and all that sort of stuff, creating points of entertainment in the purely visual way. And then Rembrandt. I mean, there's a thing that happened to Rembrandt. Somebody said, I think it was Belgium. Yeah, he said, he said Rembrandt. If he if he had only lived to half of his life, he wouldn't have been thought of as anything. But something happened, and he it suggested in these drawings that something happened. He became a far more visual oriented guy. Um, he didn't have, in my view, he didn't have all that much to lean on in his other way of working. Um, so it made some sense in the process he was going through trying to make himself into a better painter to be able to, um, to I mean, to, to, to do research into the purely visual, which is what it, which he ultimately does. He makes this complete switch and becomes, in his, in his self-portraits, become these astonishing exercises. They're so similar to the thinking, and it's not 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 the application of paint and all that sort of stuff is necessarily the same, or even the use of color. But but there's a certain amount of of um, visual truth that's gotten well away from formulaic or standards, which you might call standards, meaning accepted norms. Um, so so in photography, and probably should end it with this, but. In the photography, you have those two worlds too. This Elliot Porter on the left is something classically like what he did. Like he's trying to be a Renaissance, pre-Renaissance guy, and he's drawing every leaf. You know, he's taking photographs, shows every leaf. Every You can go into this thing and look at everything all the way back in through everything. Every single thing in here becomes realistic. Well, you can see the Boston School approach to painting is much more likely to look like this. Now, I'm saying these two are both, as I said, set up in a film noir. It's sort of a lost and found world just by nature. There's the, the, um, the, the, the mystery of shadow. Call this a clear obscure sort of model, whatever you want to call it. But you can see in the two on the right by Steichen, there is a, an evident pleasure in the same kind of delight the Boston School guys have. So this point for you, Gene, though, is not so much in your, in your quest of whether or not there's, you can apply their methods but you can see their pleasure is the same. They're, they're deriving their, their delight. They're finding ways of using the camera to, to, to recover or, 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 or um, um, you know, to um, uh, expose those, to show those delightful kinds of things that happen when you turn the lights way down or when you, or when you, uh, or just in the idea of the distribution, the beautiful distribution of spots. So, um, 
I think I leave it at that, uh, Gene. It's one of those things that I said that's just kind of you can be amused yourself with it or not, and you can think this through in d other ways. I'm only just trying to, if you just turn off the sound and go through these pictures and think about it, or just let yourself review it that way, I think you're going to get a, you're going to see what, the, I don't even have to tell you things, right? You can just, you're just, you're just going to be there. Let's slow walk it back through these images again just for fun. Keep, keep looking at other Rembrandts. Keep thinking about him and look at his different time frames. Now, nobody, I don't think anybody does anything more like the Boston School than Zorn. In that, uh, whether his methodology is the same as a whole other story, I have no idea precisely that methodology. I, I haven't looked close enough, I have to admit, to figure it out. Um, I haven't looked at all his starts like I have at the Boston School. Rodin, the guy that they said uh, that, that Tarbell said is sculpts like the, like they paint, like the Boston School guys paint. So from the visual, the question is from the visual to the actual. So that's what we're really looking for is to get entertainment and good sculptors would any time, but but good entertainment out of this playing to these guys out here, you know that sort of thing, or all of the foreign players in a in a unity, in a discussion, in an entertainment. Uh, thing together. Um, some of what you're picking up, for example, this hair could have been matte, but it's very cheeky. And you're, you're seeing corresponding elements of cheekiness in the chin and other places. This is abstract thinking that's characteristic of our form. It's not our sculpting. It doesn't mean Boston School versus something else. But you will see that the Boston School uh, has gotten itself organized much more around the, the visual entertainment. Um, the one thing that's so significantly different about sculpture is the, the various lights, the lights change. If you're looking at this light versus that light, and um, the sculptors, I've had a sculptor tell me, a, a, a pretty top sculptor, that you want varieties of light on your objects, and you want to find the entertainment no matter what kind of light it's in. The relief is an interesting place to think. I mean, the idea of relief is that it's low, but you do less detail, you do shallower form, and it's as if it were behind you in the fog. That sort of thing is, you know, that goes all the way back to Leonardo, that, that model of creating distance. But um, the, the, the entertainment of the abstractions, you know, as a primary thing. Remember, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of Rodin, I can't tell you I like it all, but there's so, there's so much that just is so fertile with imagination and delight, much like these, which were undoubtedly not intended to be seen as such by Michelangelo. So there's the alternative. Again, and we're sort of the history of classicism, you know, classicism slash academicism wants to live here. And uh, the Boston School is actually a different thing. So, uh, and it's, but it's an approach to painting that if you start, you can start with, you can go this far, you can go this far, which is maybe a little farther in execution, and, or you can go all the way to the point of having the same kind of execution as, as, a, uh, as an Ang. You can do that. Paxson sort of does it. He doesn't really start quite the same place, though. <clears throat> but you can push that execution. You'll see lots of that stuff going on here. But the way they approach it, the way they start it, they're, at, they're like so directly after that kind of beauty right from the beginning. But method is method, and I'm just showing you sort of appearances, sort of looks that are similar, sort of thinking, there, there, there's, a, there's an implication that the thinking is somewhat related, and that's the best I can do. I would never say these guys are using the same method or anything like that, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to either. But anyway, that's all for today, guys. Thank you, Gene, for bringing that to us, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Have a good painting week. Thank you all for, for your uh, subscribing, sharing, liking, all those things, comments. Keep your comments coming. I appreciate it. I know you're expecting Ilya this week. Uh, that, that didn't happen. It was my fault. We met, I messed up. Um, it may still happen, but, but I think it may not happen now. So I apologize about getting you set up to have two in a row, and then I failed you a bit. Uh, I still have to address some stuff to do that well. I still have to address some stuff with Mr. Producer anyway, so it probably wasn't going to work no matter what I, what I, what I uh, told you. In any case, hope you have a great week, and we'll see you in the next one.